Hello and welcome. I'm Barbara Slavin. I direct the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. And on behalf of my program and our Iraq Initiative, I welcome you to a discussion of the complex relationship between Iran and Iraq. Alas, relations between these two neighbors are not as smooth as uh, those between the Iran and Iraq programs at the Atlantic Council. There's a history of a terrible war in the 1980s that killed or injured a million Iranians and Iraqis, and of course, the aftermath of the 2003 US invasion of Iraq that ended the brutal rule of Saddam Hussein, but opened the country to more Iranian influence, arguably, than at any time since the Persian Empire. The inspiration for this panel uh, was a remark at the Atlantic Council a few months back by Iraqi Finance Minister Ali Alawi. He said that Iran-Iraq annual trade now amounts to $15 billion, and that it is essentially all one way, Iran selling to Iraq. And as we know in politics and in the security realm, one can also argue that Iran plays an outsized role. So we're gonna discuss the situation and what if anything can be done about it. And we have as usual, I, I would say an even greater panel than usual, beginning with my esteemed colleague, uh, Abbas Kadim, who directs the Iraq Initiative at the Atlantic Council. We also have uh, the wonderful Randa Slim, someone whose work I've admired for many years. Uh, Randa directs the Conflict Resolution and Track to Dialogues program at the Middle East uh, Institute. And we are lucky to have Mohsen Milani, uh, Executive Director of the Center for Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the University of South Florida, who has great expertise on Iran's regional policies. Uh, last but not least, we have Ahmed Tabakchali, who's a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and who is well-versed in the Iraqi economy as a veteran of the uh, capital markets. Uh, to moderate our discussion, um, we've asked uh, uh, our excellent mutual assistant, Masood Mustajabi, uh, who has not uh, only been invaluable in his work on the Iran program for the past five years, but also has helped manage the Iraq program. And this gives him, I think, a unique perspective on both countries and on the relationship between them. So Masood, over to you. Well, thank you, Barbara, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, I'm genuinely delighted to be moderating such an esteemed panel. Um, so we have seen a lot of moving parts in the region of late, with particular attention to the recent trip by U.S. President Joe Biden to Israel, the West Bank, and Saudi Arabia, where he met with GCC plus three leaders. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin made a trip just last week alongside Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to Tehran, and breaking news today in Iraq's government formation. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, but prior to that, please note that later during this discussion, our panelists will be taking questions from the audience. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access by hovering over the window until you see the bottom menu. There you will find the Q&A button, which will open the window and allow you to submit questions. So that's housekeeping. Um, and I'd just like to start with our guests, Mohsen and Randa, and then Ahmad and Abbas, for your opening remarks uh, and gather your assessment of the current state of bilateral relations between Iran and Iraq. What are the strengths and weaknesses? What binds them at the political and what about the people-to-people -people ties, cultural and religious? And then we can get into more questions. So Mohsen, uh, the floor is yours. Mohsen, you are muted. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. It is really a great honor to be on the same panel with some of the best experts in the country about Iraq and Iran. I will spend about three or four minutes uh, talking about how I see Tehran is looking at the uh, situation in Iraq today. Um, as my overall assessment of the status of the Iranian-Iraqi relations, as somebody who has been writing about Iraq and Iran relations for the past six or seven months on continuous basis, I have to tell you uh, the relationship between the two countries today are a friendlier, uh, closer than any time since the creation of modern Iraq in 1921. This does not mean there are not tensions, there are tensions, but uh, Iran and Iraq have become very close and very friendly. Let me also, at the beginning, state very clearly 
that I do not buy this argument made by many people in the past 15, 20 years, that Iran is the dominant power in Iraq, that Iraq has become a colony of Iran. I don't buy any of that. I think Iran, as Barbara correctly said, has more influence today in Iraq than it has had uh, since 1921. But that does not mean Iran is a hegemonic power. It doesn't mean Iran can dictate to Iraq. Uh, Iran simply has uh, considerable influence as a lot of other countries do in Iraq. So basically, uh, I wanna make three or four observations based on how Iran is looking at the situation in Iraq. Number one, I think in terms of concern, Iran, uh, Iranian policy after 2003, especially uh, after the new government, a new state was, was formed in Iraq, has been to create a Tehran-friendly, Shia-dominated bloc in the National Assembly within the Iraqi political system. Now, that does not mean that Iran is trying to dictate to Iraq. It cannot. Even if it wants to, it cannot. It simply means that based on eight years of awful experience with Iraq, Iran did not want to see a reputation of Saddam Hussein. Keep in mind, from the Iranian perspective, both during the imperial period as well as the revolutionary period, Iran, Iraq has been the most problematic neighbor Iran has had. Not anymore, but it used to be the case. So right now, it seems to me, Tehran is very much concerned about the fracturing of that Shia-dominated Tehran-friendly bloc. And again, this is my interpretation of, of how Iran sees things. Iranian leaders may say something completely different. Their main concern is how Muqtada Assad is operating. I think if you read Iranian newspapers, uh, you would see that there are two concerns about Muqtada Assad getting too close to uh, so-called Arab orbit, which means Sunni dominated Arab countries in the Persian Gulf, that he is getting too close to uh, 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 forces that are hostile to Iran. He has been in, on, on record for saying that he wants to disarm Iranian-backed militias, uh, Hashbul al-Shaadi in, in, in Iraq, and uh, his position of, of moving away from the uh, Iranian side to the Arab side has been quite concerning to Tehran. Now, the uh, if the new prime minister is uh, is accepted, uh, I think this is going to make Iran feel a little bit better. But still, Iran and Iranian uh, politicians are extremely concerned about the ability of one man, Muqtad Assad, and his movement to fracture this movement. Iran's second concern is the growing influence of Israel in Kurdistan. Uh, this is a serious matter for the Islamic Republic. Uh, not only Iran is concerned about the growing power of Israel in Kurdistan, Iran is also concerned about the substantial support Iranian Kurds and anti-Islamic Republic forces are getting from different countries that are being trained inside Kurdistan in Iraq. Uh, as you know, Iran has tried to do something about it. And um, my argument is that the more the Abrahamic Accord is successful, the more pressure Iran is going to uh, place on Kurdistan. The second, the third uh, factor that Iran is very much concerned about is what happens after Ayatollah Sistani dies. Uh, there is going to be a vacuum and Iran wants to make sure that that vacuum is not filled by the clerics, by Ayatollahs or grand Ayatollahs that are hostile to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Finally, the last, and that's going to be the last point I'm going to make. Iran is very much concerned about the overall trend uh, in the Persian Gulf in terms of the alliance, not alliance, in terms of cooperation between Arab countries, especially Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, and perhaps later on Saudi Arabia with Israel. And Iranian strategic goal right now is to make sure that Iraq does not follow that suit. Uh, Iran believes, Iranian leaders believe that any kind of alliance between Iran and Iraq 
uh, or any kind of strong friendship between Iran and Iraq can neutralize any attempt by Israel and its supporters to neutralize the negative effect of the uh, Abrahamic Accord. All and in all, uh, I believe Tehran is extremely happy with the developments in Iraq in the, uh, since 2003 and is going to do its best to make sure that the Tehran-friendly Shia-dominated bloc remains intact. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for those comments, uh, Mohsen. Rhonda, um, I, I wanted to turn to you for any um, opening remarks you may have, um, and uh, maybe in a regional context. Uh, first, thank you very much for the invitation, and really it's a pleasure to and honor to share the virtual podium with all of you. I would like to, you know, I, I will be addressing three challenges that I <laughs> I see it from my perspective uh, to Iran in Iraq. Um, one challenge is something that uh, Mohsen has already referred to, which is divisions among the Shia factions. I think central to Iran's goal of ensuring Iraq never constitutes a threat to the Islamic Republic is the formation and the, su and the sustenance of a strong united Shia bloc ruling Iraq. Uh, and I agree with Mohsen. I think it must be concerning to them to lose um, from among that uh, group, let's say, of loyalists to Iran or friend, or I would say friends of Iran, Muqtada Sadr, since Muqtada Sadr, in fact, was the first of the Iraqi leaders to lead a military opposition to the US uh, military in Iraq uh, after 2003, starting in 2004. And the second, I think also within that point is a concern is a split inside the PMF uh, when you have four divisions known as the Atabat uh, uh, PMF left that, that group and, and uh, from the others. And I think that also must be of concern given that the PMF um, you know, underpins uh, uh, the support that Iran can count on uh, to be always there uh, in, inside the Iraqi uh, political uh, spectrum. Uh, and I think also related to that is the divisions inside the PMF, the other PMF that are loyal uh, to Iran, uh, sometimes rogue actions by some of them without consultation with Iraq, with Iran. Uh, and it is due to the disappearance from the scenes of, you know, uh, Qasem Soleimani, but also more importantly of Al Muhandis, who was really the, I would say, coordinator, who was the master of ceremony and the architect of that whole group. And these must be sources of concern for Tehran. And, and, it's, and, and you can see that at least in, in the lead up to the formation of this government, you see Tehran moving away from this maximalist goal of having a united Shia front, including everybody, to some more moderate, practical, pragmatic front of trying to bring unity within the PMF or within the coordination framework, sorry, camp. And we'll see if, if they will succeed in forming a government after the nomination of Mr. Sudani. I want to refer to two other challenges, one of which is very much having to do with the Iraqi youth and, and, and how Iraqi youth look at Iran through the prism of a post-2003 regime that has been put in place that is, you know, Shia majority but that is a, a regime that has failed in delivering basic services and basic governance um, to, to its population. And, and in a way, by association, Iran is associated, at least in the minds of a good majority of the Iraqi, uh, of the Iraqi uh, youth, including Iraqi Shia youth, of being part and parcel of this failed project. Uh, that that uh, that is that is that has been now in place since 2003, and specifically, this perception has been solidified by the assistance that Iran, as well as uh, 
uh, uh, factions affiliated with Iran have le lent in 2019 to bring down the protest by killing protesters, by targeting key civic leaders. And so for so so that that association between Iran and that failed project is is a major challenge for Iran to overcome. And to be very honest, I don't know how it can be overcome without a major change to the political system that is in place. That's a second important challenge that I don't think even Iran and especially the people who are in charge of Iraq policies in Iran, especially the IRGC, are paying too much attention to that. But this is in the long term, especially that it, it involves a big say a big yeah, group of, of Iraqi youth is going to be a major challenge to the continuation of friend relations between Iran and Iraq. And finally, uh, the third challenge has to do with, uh, with Iraq regional posturing and the role it has been playing uh, in, 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 how to say, the role it has been trying to carve for itself as a state in between Iran and an, a, a, an Arab axis. However, I think what the Jeddah summit did, at least for the Iranians, and at least again, reading media, not in Persian, but in Arabic that are friendly to Iran, uh, it, it seems to have solidified the perception that Iraq has in a way by being part of the GCC plus three has made a choice from, has moved away from the neutral position it has, you know, for a while tried to occupy, which is between Iran and between the Arab axis, between uh, a mediator between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that by being at that table, you know, with President Biden as part of the GCC plus three, that Iraq, at least with Prime Minister Qadami, has made a choice to you know, move more into an Arab Sunni majority alliance that although you know, they went, all the Arab leaders went to great length to say it's not an anti-Iran alliance, but it's definitely motivated and driven by a concern and by, a, uh, by fears of, 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 of Iran and by perception of Iran as a regional hegemon that has um, a project in the region that, do not that does not necessarily uh, uh, coincide with the interest of the Arab region. I will stop at this point. I think I will, I'm told that I have to like come next after this. So, um, well, I'll, I'll repeat what my two colleagues said earlier. It's a pleasure to be among you all. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be among uh, such a, a group of people. Now, what I'm going to go over is, uh, I'll, I'll go over obviously on the economics of uh, Iraq and Iran. Um, and I'd like to go over two things, and two things that to me that matter a great deal. One is uh, what Barbara started with, and that is the one-sided uh, trade relation between the two countries. There is more to it than the, uh, the one-sided thing. But the real question is not so much as the size, but the fact is, why is uh, why are Iran's exports to Iraq actually so little? Uh, and I can go over in detail when we talk about that a bit later. But if you look at trade, and I'm not talking about trade, I mean trade. There's two kinds of trade: there's services, and there is merchandise. Services is like when we buy electricity, when we buy uh, engineering services, and so forth. Or we look at trade, actually the merchandise trade. Iran's trade with Iraq peaked at about six, six and a half billion dollars in around 2012, and pretty much stayed at that level throughout until this year. Uh, and I'm talking about the average. Uh, there's always going to be some strange years, whereas something like 2018, when we had the uh, Trump imposition of sanctions, and you had people sort of bringing back forward orders from, you know, like you buy now ahead of next year and so forth. So you have a huge bounce in trade. And then you have um, the follow up like 2020, when you have very low trade because of COVID. But if you average it, it's six and a half billion dollars a year that we export from Iran. By if you look at our next neighbor, Turkey, we import something like $10.5 billion from them over the same time period. And yet, uh, we have a huge border 
uh, with Iran, and Iran is supposed to be a dominant uh, player in Iraq, and it's supposed to be dominant economically. And you know that, that I think that is really interesting. The more interesting, by the way, within that is Iran's anxiety in trying to portray that as something a lot bigger than what it is. Um, I use, but obviously, by the way, when I talk of data, I use data that comes in from Iran's customs and from Turkey's customs. So I use their own data as opposed to Iraqi data because it will always have issues with Iraqi data in terms of completeness and so forth. And so you'll see, and it's here, like when, when, when they've talked about, you know, Raisi sort of like trade from the time he became president has become something like, you know, eight uh, something billion dollars and what have you. The reality is that smoke and mirrors. There's sometimes... Uh, when you hear their statements, uh, part of half of my work is trying to figure out really what they're saying, because you look at the official data and you try to match it with what they say. And it's clear to me that it's a lot of it is smoke and mirrors. So sometimes you combine the eight or nine billion dollars that they're talking about is not only trade, but actually trade and services. So, you know, it, it's, it's a lot more. And to me, that, that disguises their anxiety. So you see figures of, you know, up 18%, 25%, so forth. There are always going to be something special, and I can go over that in more detail. So actually, that, I think that is quite interesting. The reporting, obviously, is always um, emotional, is always uh, um, sort of like, you know, uh, look at how much trade and so forth, but you really got to compare it to uh, trade with other countries. So again, that in a way um, supports what Mohsen is saying, is that Iran is not really as dominant as people think it is. Yes, it is dominant beyond the shadow of doubt with uh, non-state actors, and it worked for them fantastically well until Iraq stabilized. But I think after that, it would be a different story. I think the other one, which is really just as important, and it dominates almost all discussion and it dominates all the policy, especially when it comes to the US, and that's Iraq's dependence on Iran uh, for gas uh, to power its, its needs. And I think even then, there is two huge issues, structural issues that seems to be absent from any discussion that always takes place. And every, I, think, I, know I mean discussion as well as reporting. On the one hand, you see the Americans always are keen on helping Iraq get rid of its dependence on Iran. That's one. On the other hand, um, Iran freaks out whenever something like that is, is, is being said. The reality of the matter is, what people don't seem to understand, is that Iraq's power deficit is a structural issue within Iraq. We, the deficit between supply and demand is going to increase. And going to increase, why? Because the uh, demand growth is outstripping supply growth. So yes, in three or four years' time, we might be able to replace our current dependence on whatever gas that comes from it. <clears throat> However, but in, in three years' time, if we replace it, the gap that's going to grow is going to grow even bigger. So in a way, we will never have the need, the need, the, the need to uh, import gas will not end unless we do ma massive structural changes. On the other hand, which is just as important, is Iran's own limitations in having, um, creating power and creating its own gas. Iran is one of the top three gas uh, uh, reserves in the world, uh, what it owns, and yet its production is actually pretty much minuscule. And the reason why they, uh, for example, cut power from us, you talk 2018, you talk 2019, and this year and so forth, it's not because we accumulate debts. We've been accumulating debts with Iran every year since we first started um, importing electricity from 2015. Every year we accumulate this. They don't, by the way, stop it, not because we're not paying. They stop it because they can't meet their own demands. And why can't they meet their own demands? Because their systems. Their power, uh, the, the, the electricity generation, by the way, that's one of the few things that, um, you know, I'm going to take a side issue here. I was talking to a friend yesterday about Iraq and so forth, and he told me he stopped um, doing work for Iraq on, on, on uh, uh, oil and so forth because it's always very depressing. And when you hear the Iran story uh, on, uh, on, on, on their own power systems, you know that, you know, uh, misery loves company. So they're, they're, they're not that much better than us and, and so forth. And the, and the reason why is that their systems have suffered from their own mismanagement, as well as the sanctions that one or the other have been imposed on Iran since 1979. Full sanctions went to force in 2012. Their power system needs incredible Electricity generation system needs a lot of work, which is just as bad as ours. Plus, 
their uh, gas generation is not going to grow. I mean, even if we need X amount of gas from Iran next few years, they won't be able to supply it in very hard years, like when you get a dry year like now. So I think in a way, a lot of the policy is going to go around. I mean, for Iran, certainly they need access to foreign capital to improve their systems, and they're not going to get it if they stay the way they are. And for Iran, we will not be short. We will always need more power on, until, unless we restructure our whole um, um, electricity sector. And yet it will dominate stuff. So I'll leave it here and I can discuss those in maybe more details if people want to be bored even more than this uh, later on. So thank you for that. I'll leave it to my next colleague. Thank you all and welcome to uh, this event. I appreciate uh, the uh, always the cooperation with the um, Iran Initiative and, and Barbara uh, on this. And uh, the colleagues here, are we are all working together as a team for a long time. So it's an honor and pleasure to work again and have this opportunity. Um, the, uh, it's very hard to add to the uh, expert opinions that have been given, but I'm going to focus on a couple of other issues and hopefully not talk, take long. Uh, the uh, the, the Iraq-Iran relations are always uh, complex. And the reason for that is that it is not a normal relation that goes smoothly uh, and the international uh, eyes uh, the, uh, these days. The Iran is a country that has uh, receives a lot of negative uh, press and negative publicity. Anything uh, that uh, involves Iran normally, uh, it's, it's on the radar and by some powerful media outlets regionally and internationally. <clears throat> so naturally, uh, anything that happens, uh, even the positive uh, uh, cases, tend to be uh, to have a, a negative sh uh, shadow cast over them, uh, and and that's the nature of of the international relations, unfortunately. <clears throat> so so it, we are really working with a case that is not a normal case or normal relation between two countries. Uh, it is true that Iran has had a uh, stronger relations with Iraq than Iraq's neighbors. Uh, this is an undeniable uh, fact, uh, but one should not really look at this and blame it on the Iraqis or on the Iranians. Uh, I think the blame doesn't originate there. Iran did have a head start that was given to them right after 2003. Intuitively, you would have thought that Iran would be the country that would boycott the new Iraq because it was uh, the, the change was brought up by America and the Americans became the neighbors of Iran. Indeed, Ambassador Paul Bremer, for the until he was heavily criticized, began to speak about Iraq with the uh, pronoun we every time he spoke about the Iraqis until somebody told him, no, 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 <laughs> you are not the Iraqis. You cannot talk about our neighbors uh, when we talk about Iraq neighbors. So the United States was really to that level. So you intuitively would have thought that Iran would have boycotted that. And you would have also intuitively thought that US major allies like the Saudis would have embraced that. First, they fought a war against Saddam Hussein. Uh, Saddam Hussein occupied one of their GCC members and uh, uh, threatened them according to, to all their understanding of the Iraqi relations. Uh, the relations were terrible until that point. No, no, no diplomatic, no other trade or, or economic relations. Yet the Saudis who, were, who should have welcomed the, the change that was brought by the United States, in fact, boycotted Iraq. And boycotted Iraq on sectarian causes. Uh, that, that was undeniable also. They, uh, and they continued with that policy until the uh, 2016, basically. So that's, you know, from 2003 to 2013 years where they did not open an embassy, they did not even embrace uh, Iraq in any way. Uh, more than that, they in fact used their uh, powerful media to undermine all of the progress that was going on to Iraq, even to the complaints of the United States. More than that, they even went as far as admitting it, and as, as Prince Turkil Faisal wrote in an article in one of the America's greatest or largest uh, newspapers where he said, we are acting against 
the Iraq, the U.S. policy uh, in, in Iraq. Um, so, so it is uh, more than that. Also, they want out to to reduce all of the relations of Iraq with the Arab world, with Iraq's relations with Saudi. So until today, you hear the narrative that Iraq has departed from its Arab, uh, its Arab uh, depth and Iraq is returning to its Arab depth. No, it's not true. Uh, only Saudi in, in that case uh, was the country that rejected Iraq. Iraq relations with Kuwait were wonderful from the beginning. Iraq's relations uh, with Jordan were great. Iraq's relations with Egypt were good. Uh, Iraq's relation with with the rest of the Arab world were were, were really in, in great in great uh, uh, position. Uh, also, um, Iraq's relations with Turkey, uh, even though Turkey objected to the change in Iraq initially and didn't allow the United States access, but still, Turkey jumped from the beginning, just like Iran. It's not a coincidence that Turkey, Jordan, and Iran have the best trade relations with Iraq. Uh, now and all along since 2003 is because they, from the beginning, uh, accepted the new Iraq and they had the infrastructure necessary for that trade exchange. They had the, uh, the system in place. And it's very hard to come 13 years, 14 years later, and you want to compete. You know, this is very hard. It's, uh, the, the, the people are asking Iraq right now to spend billions of dollars to put a, an infrastructure to import uh, electricity and gas from, from, from the, the Gulf. Well, why spend these billions to change your dependence on one country to another? Uh, you know, into, you know the, 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 the wise thing is to spend these billions of dollars to develop the uh, domestic Iraqi capabilities to get the gas and to get those rather than uh, switching dependence from one country to another. So, so there's, there are a lot of those misconceptions about these, these relations uh, that, that Iraq and Iran uh, have. And I believe that when, when Iran reintegrates into the international community, much of that will go away. It will, the relation will be just like another relation. Nobody's speaking about the, 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 the relation between Iraq and Jordan or Iraq and Turkey. Turkey, Turkey's a trade exchange on Ahmed is the expert on that is even higher than it comes only after China. Uh, and uh, nobody really, even the, the last few days when Turkey has had deep trouble uh, with Iraq. Uh, in fact, you've seen many people who normally um, uh, attack the Iraq Iran and right relations came out to the defense of Turkey for some position that is completely indefensible, uh, shelling. A, 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 a civilian Iraqi tourist side and killing uh, a number of Iraqis, all civilians, in a place that has nothing to do with, with any military value whatsoever. Uh, yet Turkey doesn't receive that, gets a pass uh, in many media outlets. So I think we need to look at that. The other th reason, and I will close with that, there is a lot to talk about later, uh, I think is the, uh, the attitude, um, you know, what, what what is the relation here? The, 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 what are the dimensions of this relation? You have the economic uh, relations that uh, Ahmed and, and, and everyone else just spoke about. You have the political relations, the security relations also. These are normal. But also there are the deep cultural relations, deep religious relations. Uh, Iraq and, uh, and, and Iran, and even uh, before the creation of, of the new modern state of Iraq, uh, those were prominent. Uh, in, the, in the Iranian interest. From the, the, the first treaty that, that the Ottomans and, and the Safavids had in, in 1638, uh, the Zohab Treaty, uh, which really was revolving around this idea of the religious relations and the shrines on both sides. Uh, Iraqis do go to Iran for, for religious visits. Iranians go to Iraq for the same reason. Also, Iraqis go, go for medical treatment uh, in, in Iran. Uh, it's very hard as an Iraqi to use your Iraqi passport and get a visa to any country uh, immediately. Uh, and to Iran, you go even without paying visa fees. Turkey, which is another popular place, they just raise their visa fees uh, on Iraq, is where Iraqis probably are having a hard time paying that, uh, the, the original amount. Now they raised it by a, a, a large amount. And, you know, 
to Iran, they just waived the visas between the two countries. You go to Iran, you don't get bothered, you don't get asked any questions, unlike what you do in Arab countries, if you ever get a visa. There are countries where you could not get a visa, unless it is for pilgrimage or something. So that also is a reason why uh, this access, there is more trust that has been built uh, between Iran and Iraq at the political level, also at the popular level. It, uh, granted that a lopsided relation in the region where Iraq, uh, Iranian relations dominate the Iraqi uh, regional relations is an unhealthy situation. It is very welcome that Iraq right now is having or enjoying better relations with countries that stood against the ch political change in Iraq and the democratic process like Saudi Arabia um, and, and even Syria that was a conduit for the GCC for a time. Now it's, it's, it's less of a problem for Iraq. It is very welcoming and it is really good that Iraq is building good relations with Jordan and Egypt through this uh, economic alliance. Iraq was invited to the GCC summit as one of three regional countries, four non-GCC countries. There is an acknowledgement of Iraq right now, and I think it's great to stay that way, uh, but it should not be uh, a choice of either or. Um, just like excellent relations of Iraq with its Arab neighbors and with Turkey are important and necessary, I think, same thing with uh, the relations with Iran. I look forward to um, more discussion on those issues. Thank you, Abbas. Thank you uh, all for the historical context and key insights. I want to pick up on some of these points throughout this conversation, but Abbas, I'm going to come right back to you. There was uh, breaking news out of Baghdad uh, after months of political uh, stalemate. The Iraqi parliament uh, nominated Mohammad Shia al-Sudani to be the new Iraqi prime minister. So I'd love your thoughts on that before we move on. Well, this is the good news. I, I hope that uh, the uh, process uh, sees, uh, is, is uh, seen through. Uh, nominating somebody, uh, or it's, he was not even really nominated right now. It is just an internal uh, Shia coalition uh, agreement among themselves. Uh, this was never an issue in past government formations. So now we are moving to having that as an achievement. But in fact, uh, the process, first of all, you need to appoint an Iraqi president or elect an Iraqi president. And until now, the Iraqi president was not elected the new Iraqi president. So before that, there is no government formation. Uh, there is some good news that uh, both uh, the Kurdish uh, parties have agreed on a compromise candidate for the presidency. If that gentleman gets a, uh, a, 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 um, uh, the vote in the parliament, and there is a quorum. Uh, we anticipate that if the Kurds agree on a person, there will be a quorum, two-third quorum, quorum in the parliament. Then we will have a president within the next uh, couple of weeks. Then we have 45 days to see if uh, um, uh, Mohammed uh, Shia Sudani will be able to form the government and get his program and government uh, gain the confidence of the parliament. He's a He has a good reputation. He is good... Uh, he, he has worked uh, with, with great experience, both at the local level and at the, um, and, and the national level. Uh, and he seems to be, uh, I think if there is anybody who can get a, uh, from the, the, the current uh, Shia uh, framework coalition, if anyone can get a confidence, then probably the closest would be Mohammed Shah Sid Sudani. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, a lot of work to be done in Iraq. Um, but I want to turn to uh, Baghdad media talks. Um, so last month, Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Al-Qadmi's trip to Iran came a day after he traveled to Saudi Arabia, reportedly with the aim of reactivating the Baghdad media talks between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And just over this weekend, we have seen an announcement made by Iraq's Foreign Minister Fouad Hussein that Saudi and Iran have reportedly agreed to hold the first public meeting at the level of foreign ministers in Baghdad. So a few questions on this. How do you evaluate the ongoing negotiations? How has Iraq found itself in this role? And what are the prospects of an Iraqi brokered peace process between Iran and Saudi Arabia? We've also recently heard, and Abbas mentioned, I believe, uh, Jordan and Iran, Egypt and Iran talks in Baghdad, Baghdad, if you may have any thoughts on these. Mohsen, uh, <coughs> 
Yes, um, thank you. If you do not mind, may I just add uh, a couple of points about some of the uh, issues raised by my good colleagues. Uh, there is, There was a very interesting detailed uh, paper uh, written by the Research uh, Center for the Iranian Parliament about uh, three and a half years ago, and I've used it extensively. Um, I think it's one of the more uh, in, uh, perceptive pieces I've read uh, by, by an Iranian center about Iraq. And one of the points that was made in that paper is that, uh, remember, this is a think tank that belongs to the Iranian parliament. And one of the points that it was made was that Iran should begin to readjust itself to the reality that even the most religious Iraqi Shiites are becoming uh, much more receptive to nationalistic ideas, especially the youth of Iraq, exactly the point that uh, Rhonda was making. And uh, uh, the paper suggested that Iran should move away from too much focus on religious issues. And I believe what they said is absolutely accurate. And the way Iran should do its business with Iraq is to go beyond its uh, traditional relationship with religious sector and go to the more uh, non-religious secular Shiite, and uh, they could be uh, the future of, of Iraq. Uh, the, the other point I want to make is that I talk about um, that Shia dominated uh, bloc. This is not only important for Iran, it is also important for Iraq, and Iraqis know that. That Iran, despite everything that it does, and Iran has done a lot of bad things, no doubt about it, a lot of mischiefs, I agree with it. But the Iranians, Iranian Shiites are the natural ally of Iraqi Shiites. And that became visible uh, after the rise of ISIS in Iraq. I can't think of any country, and please correct me. If I'm exaggerating, please correct me. I don't know of a single country in the region that helped Iraq more in defeating ISIS than the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's where you see uh, that natural affinity between the two. Now, as to your excellent question, I praise Iraq for, pay, uh, for playing that important role to mediate between Iran and Iraq. Uh, if you look at some of the documents that they released, and I've done that, released a few years ago by Vikiliki, uh, about uh, uh, Ibn uh, Nuri al-Maliki. He was complaining to the Americans, not publicly, uh, but privately. He was complaining that Iraq had become a battleground for the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia and between Iran and the United States. And he was begging the Americans to try to go move away from that. And I think Prime Minister Kazemi is trying to do that. It is to the Iranian uh, national interest, as well as to the national interests of Saudi Arabia, to go back and try to address their political disagreements. I always talk about the single most perceptive comment I've heard about Iran and Saudi Arabia from an American politician, from former President uh, uh, Obama, who essentially said in his interview, uh, with a prominent American journalist, that Iran and Saudi Arabia must accept the fact that they cannot eliminate each other's influence in that region of the world. They should try to live and try to work together. And that's the point that I believe I have always believed in. Saudi Arabia is an incredibly important, powerful country. Uh, it's an Islamic country. They don't really have anything against Iran, nor should Iran have anything against Saudi Arabia. And it is to their advantage to put aside their difference and try to come up with a political solution to their problems. And I think, I cannot think of a country that can play that role better than uh, Iraq and its good prime minister, Mr. Qasemi. I would like to add, if it's possible to what Mohsen said, I totally agree with you that Iraq is a perfect, in principle, state mediator between Iran and Saudi Arabia. However, until now, 
and I'm putting here my conflict resolution, mediation, negotiation background. That role has pivoted around the person of Qadimi. Uh, I mean, the trust he has developed over the years, starting when he was under, in, as part of the cabinet of Mr. Al, Dr. Al Abadi, uh, director of the National Intelligence Services, developing a good relationship with his counterpart, both Saudi Arabia and Iran, developing good relationship with. Uh, with the leaders, you know, in, in both countries. And so the question is, uh, and, 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 and even in my own conversation with some Saudi officials, when I ask why Iraq, so of, of course, the first thing that comes out is, uh, is the trust and Qadimi. But the second point that comes out is the interest, at least on the Saudi part, to help Qadimi gain more credibility in Iraq vis-a-vis -vis other contenders for the PM post. So hoping that he can get another run in the PM office, a second term, it's not going to happen. So the challenge, and, and, and even despite the fact that there have been five rounds of these talks, there have yet, we have yet to see an, institution, an institutional architecture develop within the foreign ministry for mediation. If you compare, for example, in the 70s, 80s, Algeria used to be the small state mediator par excellence in the region. And during that time, they had a whole team, a whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a whole team, a whole uh, support process inside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which was at the time led by uh, uh, Mr. Bouteflika, who later became uh, 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 president, but but that team also had a lot of experience gained from their negotiations with the French for independence. So there was a, so there was an institutional underpinning for that role. There was skills underpinning for that role, and there was a trust that Algeria has developed with these countries. So in the case of Iraq, we have a trust developed by a prime minister with at least one of the parties. And that trust has been limited so far to that particular prime minister. So going forward, my worry is that if we, I mean, it looks like we are going to have a different prime minister, it's going to take him time to establish himself as a credible, trustworthy mediator, as a person. Remember, in this part of the world, personal relationships matter. People need to get to know that mediator on a personal basis. And they don't have that with Mr. As Sudani. He might be the best person and nominee for the job with the domestic experience. But from what I'm hearing, he doesn't have the kind of international connections network that Mr. Qadimi has. So my fear is that that role that Iraq has successfully played until now as a mediator between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which I agree totally with Mohsen, that relationship need to go into a working relationship. There will be mistrust. You are not going to eliminate years of mistrust, but they need to work together. They need to have a modicum of a working relationship, which they can have. And the question is, who's going to play that role if the Iraqi prime minister next, you know, future cannot play that role? I, I'm pretty sure there will be other platform. Maybe Kuwait can come in. Maybe Oman can come in. But I'm afraid that that role that Iraq has played until now is really going to, I mean, is, is, has been limited to one person, has not been institutionalized, and hopefully that role can be carried over by other regional countries that enjoy the trust of both parties. Abbas or Ahmed, uh, if you have any follow-ups. Okay, we can move on. Um, so. There's a, a question I have uh, on electricity, uh, and uh, Ahmed, I'll turn to you. With four main transmission lines between Iran and Iraq, most Iraqi power plants depend on gas supplied by Iran. Uh, Iraq announced in April that it had reached an agreement with Iran for a resumption of Iranian gas supplies, with Baghdad repaying debts owed to Tehran in installments. Now, as we know, Iran has periodically switched off its gas supplies because of its own needs and the accumulation of debt. 
U.S. sanctions on Iran oil and gas have comp complicated these payments or its arrears. The U.S. periodically gives Iraq sanctions waivers, allowing it to pay for its imports from Iran. With that in mind, are there alternatives to this supply from Turkey, Qatar? Um, is there potential of uniting Iraq's electricity grid with Saudi Arabia? And furthermore, Ambassador David Mack asks, can Iraq become the hub for electricity exchanges between Iran and Saudi Arabia in cases of seasonally fluctuating demands in their markets? Oh, so you leave the hard questions to me. Okay, <laughs> as, as, as I said, um, Basically, I think we, the, the main issue one has to understand is that uh, unless we restructure our electricity sector, what that, by that I mean how we price electricity, how we ration, how we offer it and so forth, which is a massive um, undertaking if we ever do that. Our demand will outstrip our supply growth no matter what. So yes, the answer is, do we need to? Should we? Absolutely. I think we need to work uh, with all our neighbors. We need to integrate our economies into all other economies and vice versa. And yes, uh, working with the uh, GCC grid, Jordan, Turkey, it's all extremely positive. Also, I think uh, in the sense of Iraq's own unity, working with the Kurds, with, 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 with the KRI on actually, instead of uh, exporting uh, or having plans or dreams for exporting gas to Europe, in fact, anything, it should be exported internally to within the country. But the main issue, by the way, there's gotta be a thing. Can we become in time a, a thing? That requires massive changes to the way we work, all of us. Uh, on the one hand, most of the GCC, um, pretty much is sort of as guilty as we are in terms of what fuel they use to generate their electricity. Uh, they don't have enough gas. They mostly, I mean, they have gas, but they use it all. And they uh, pretty much sort of use oil as, as, as useful. It's the only country that has a massive amounts of gas that can make a difference is Iran. But if Iran stays the way it is, it will never grow uh, its gas. I mean, there, uh, in a way, I mean, we, we um, you know, uh, we started the discussions with, you know, Iran is not the uh, massive, uh, you know, uh, powerful player and so forth. I think economically, they're even more of a midget than anybody else, given the potential size that they can have. Their industry is underdeveloped. It means massive amount of investments. The potential is there. So Iraq, you know, can can sort of become a, a hub, but I think that's a very, very, very long-term story. If anything, if we can, all of us as... Um, you know, um, sort of give, give up all this um, uh, conflict over what's perceived to be, you know, sort of the influence of X or Y and Z, and look at our own issues, all of us, which is massive demographic demand for uh, uh, for good service and so on, electricity is one of them. Uh, on the other hand, like, you know, sort of Iran has massive gas supplies, yet it's pretty much as a midget in terms of supplying them to itself as well as to the region. Um, if it doesn't open up the world, if it stays the way it is, then it's not going to be able to get the funds. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians, uh, Russia might have uh, the ability, but Russia would not have the incentive to encourage the growth of um, uh, of, uh, of Iran's uh, power sort of uh, gas supplies as a potential competitor to itself. So that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, without without foreign investments, i.e., mostly European and US it will not happen and therefore it will always be stunted. But I think ultimately the, the whole discussions that, that currently goes on in terms of, you know, we in Iraq of Iran uh, you know, get their region supply. I think what, what, what you know, the, I think the supply they're talking about from the GCC, it's not gonna be more than one or two gigawatts. And then, you know, that's pretty much a drop of the ocean of our needs. Currently, our peak demand is about 31 gigawatts and we can only supply 21 at the peak. And that will grow. So yes, one or two gigawatts from the region is incredibly positive. And the more we integrate our economies on mutual benefit to uh, to all parties, the better it is. But I think it all can work. Um, but you know, you, you'll need a massive um, amount of uh, maturity that so far has been lacking uh, by whole players. Uh, one thing, if I may add, is uh, in in principle. Um, it's good to have this integration 
of the grid in the region. It, uh, uh, so long as it is depoliticized and it is done for the actual purpose and philosophy of it, that it is great to, for any region in the world to be integrated with electricity. You can't store electricity. Once you generate it, you need to use it. Uh, you know, and and if, if you have access, you will end up either losing that or reducing your production. So, you know, but if there is a neighbor that can use it is great. You can make money out of it, but also you can help others uh, develop. It's it's an important element, just like linking uh, the, the, these countries with uh, railroad, with so many other infrastructure. So it will be used first for the general development of the region. Also, it helps with emergencies. It should not be uh, one a political reason. I mean, since my days in Iraq in the 1970s and 80s, we've had bad electricity. Nobody ever thought or encouraged Iraq to link with the Gulf. Only when it became an issue that Iraq is dependent on Iran, then they all jumped and they said, yeah, we will, we will give you anything you want. Otherwise, the Gulf would not really be interested in that. And even, I, you know, Brenda and I were in Baghdad when this agreement initially was signed in September of 2019. And until now, we are, you know, Iraq, how many summers Iraqis had were baked by, by the heat and no electricity from the Gulf. And they just made this as another great achievement of the Jeddah conference that Iraq linked. You know, no, I, these were signed long time ago. Uh, and if you do it really not for politics, but for development, for, for the better of the region as a, uh, as a whole, to use it as a backup in cases of emergencies, to redistribute, also build that sort of interconnectivity. It's one of the main tools of liberal international relations theory, that when you are codependent economically and trade and all of other things, you are less likely to have conflict because everybody will lose. So that should be the case, but also focus has to be done also on the capacity of these countries uh, in, internally. It should not be a replacement of, for a country that has this wealth of oil and petroleum and gas and all of that to you know, say their biggest accomplishment has been buying a uh, gas from this country or that country and building infrastructure for it. So it's really, I think, we need the principle is great, but it needs to you need to take the politics away from it and focus on the economic and, and social and also uh, uh, development uh, positives that come from it. Thank you for the detailed answers. Uh, so you guys mentioned, uh, Mohsen actually mentioned in the outset, uh, and I, so I have a question on the Iran Kurdistan region. Um, Iran maintains deep ties with the major Kurdish parties, but has shown hostility to the KDP's rumored ties with Israel, to the point of using missiles for emphasis. Meanwhile, both China and Russia see this area as a possible point of expansion into the region, as Russia owns much of the Kurdistan region's internal pipelines and Chinese firms appear anxious to engage in development projects. More recently, the Baghdad versus Erbil contest over the legality of Kurdish oil contracts and exports was decided by the Iraqi Supreme Court, which struck down KRG oil sector independence. So a few questions to anyone that may want to take them. How have Baghdad and Tehran's relationship with Erbil evolved? As U.S. influence in the region continues to dwindle, how concerning is Russia and China's growing influence in the Iraq and Kurdistan region? And what security threats and conflicts could arise from KDP-Israeli ties? I was thinking that Mohsen would uh, take this since he was uh, uh, ready to speak before I jumped in. So Mohsen, do you want to start? Yes, let me just uh, thank you for, uh, Brother Abbas, thank you for uh, uh, letting me answer the tough one, <laughs> the tough question. But Nothing you cannot handle. Thank you. Uh, I think the, the uh, one of the four areas of concern that I mentioned, as far as Iran is concerned, is the uh, question of uh, uh, Israeli influence in uh, Kurdistan. Uh, something that perhaps some of your audience might not know or might not know the detail of it is the deep involvement that both Iran and Israel prior to the 1979 revolution had in Kurdistan. 
uh, from what I understand, and I could be wrong about this, I read this in a, in a very interesting book about Kurdistan that even the uh, Kurdistan Intelligence Agency in the 1960s was established with the help of uh, Iranian Sawak and Mossad. Uh, whether it's true or not, I do not know. That's what I read. What I do know is that in the 1970s, uh, the Shah of Iran uh, used the Kurds as a proxy against Saddam Hussein. And the 1975 Algiers Accords was the result of incredible pressure that uh, the Kurds had on the Iraqi army. As a matter of fact, there was an axis of Mossad, CIA, and, uh, and uh, uh, Sawak uh, that armed uh, the Kurds. And the calculation of the Shah was that if I'm going to become the dominant power in the Persian Gulf, the only country that can stop me is Saddam Hussein. The only way I can keep Saddam Hussein away from the warm waters of the Persian Gulf is to keep him busy in, in the north. And the Israelis felt the same way, that as long as they can keep the Iraqi army away from the Arab-Israeli conflict and preoccupied with the Kurds, uh, they would support it. But 1975, the Shah decided to get out of that support. And that's why we had the, uh, the agreements. And, and this relationship continued. Mm -hmm. So today, for Iran, uh, it's OK if the Russians increase their influence in Kurdistan, or even the Turks. For Iran, the, uh, the red line is the Israelis. And I think this is one of the areas they're not going to compromise. And, and as I said, uh, they're very concerned. There was a report uh, in Iranian newspapers uh, a few days ago that the team of uh, uh, Israeli trained uh, ex uh, agents were arrested inside Iran trying to foment trouble in one of the nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm. I have zero idea whether it's true or not. The report came from a, a newspaper uh, from a website that is close to the Iranian. Supreme National Security Council. But the important point is that the Iranians are saying uh, the area of infiltration was from Kurdistan. They said the same thing uh, before about a lot of areas. So uh, that is one area that potentially can become uh, problematic in terms of Iran, Iraq's relationship, depending on how the new prime minister, whoever that is, is going to handle this sensitive issue. Can I add something here to the very important point that Mohsen has, has, uh, has just uh, presented? Uh, remember, Ben-Gurion periphery theory, you know, Ben-Gurion periphery theory is that one way to break at the time, now it's maybe different with the Abraham Accords, but one way to break the isolation of Israel, you know, uh, from the sea of Arab Muslim nations support, uh, surrounding it is to create some kind of like, not satellite state, but satellite presence relationship with minority groups around in the region. And the two minority groups at the time that were mentioned were the Kurds of Iraq and the Maronites of Lebanon. And so this is something also, Allah, when you talk with Israeli security strategists, they say this has been abandoned, is not no more part of the Israeli military doctrine, granted. But this is still something that comes out in conversation in the Arab region when you talk about Israel's role or Israel presence in and, and relationship with Kurdish region in Iraq, as well as with Maronites in Lebanon. I believe that uh, Iraq needs to be left alone when it comes to the Abraham Accords and the relations with Israel. Um, Iraq will not normalize with Israel for several reasons. One of them is the uniqueness of the Iraqi sort of society and also the system itself. Let's look at the countries that normalized with Israel, either countries that had reasons to do that, like Jordan and, and, and Egypt, because they had land and they had borders and, and you know, uh, many other issues, that, plus the pressure that came to, on them. Uh, and there are countries that were able to normalize because they, uh, they don't have any public participation. There is one person 
who would make the decision and the people can accept it. Uh, or if anybody wants to go public against it, they would chop his head. So you don't have that in Iraq. Iraq, both reasons are not available. Iraq, Iraq doesn't have any border with Israel, doesn't have any land dis- dispute, doesn't have any, any issues. And Iraq also does not have a tyranny right now. Who is the prime minister who can make such a, an explosive decision and stay in his position uh, for, for a day? That's, that's an issue. I mean, that's, you know, we, we've had that. Plus, you know, the, the testing balloons that Israel had in Kurdistan with this normalization meeting in Kurdistan, a few issues such as the oil being exported illegally. In many ways, it's illegal to export oil out of Soma to any country, but also the um, Kurdistan regional government, you know, again, the reports are abundant and, you know, although they deny that, but anyway, it is it is even uh, double a violation of, of all Iraqi laws. What did it lead to? They led to Iraq having the toughest uh, law against normalization with Israel on the books ever. We didn't have that. We had one clause in the Iraqi penal code uh, and it has so many loopholes. Now uh, the, there is an entire law banning the, the, the uh, it was just passed by this Congress, by this, uh, I mean, um, uh, Parliament, Council of Representatives. Uh, so it's even harder right now for a politician or for a, a private Iraqi citizen to have any kind of association whatsoever with Israel. And more importantly, I think, Iraq right now has a list of priorities that would make 70 pages. And you don't find Israel on that list of priorities. You need to add the 71st page to hopefully put something like that. So there is really no, no issue. I think the, the US and all other countries who have close relations with Iraq, especially also the regional countries that are normalizing with Israel and they are trying to put pressure pressure on Iraq to to normalize. They need to leave Iraq alone. They, they, you know, this is not an issue. Even when Prime Minister Kadhimi decided to accept the invitation to attend the GCC summit, you know, the main thing was, okay, this is a summit on normalization and and, and, and he received a lot of criticism for attending because of that, uh, you know, any smell of any back door toward normalization makes the life of the Iraqi government very hard and also undermines the positives that we were just talking about, Meet Iraqi government being able to mediate, Iraqi government being able to integrate with countries. You know, the GCC right now is on its way between normalizing of on the table or under the table. You know, if you really keep that as a pressure, on Iraq and make it obvious that any relation with these normalizing countries is a backdoor to a relation with Israel, you will undo all of the progress that was made in integrating Iraqi relations with the rest of its neighborhood. So I think for practical purposes, for Iraq's sake also, uh, and also for sanity's sake, you know, it's insane to think that Iraq will normalize with Israel. It's not going to happen. Thank you. Um, so we mentioned uh, the United States. So in Washington, Iraq policy seems uh, to largely be an extension of Iran policy. We often hear from Iraqis that they are pressured by the U.S. and Iran to the detriment of what may benefit Iraq itself. So I have two questions here. So how do we reconcile this pressure by Iraq uh, on Iraq, rather, by the U.S. and the uh, Iran standoff? How is Iraq managing this dynamic? And I wonder what kind of new tools of policy might we need for an Iraq-centric U.S. foreign policy? And furthermore, uh, for Abbas Mohsen Randa, will Iraq push out the last American forces at the behest of Iran-backed groups, or do you think a small U.S. military presence is tenable for the long term? I think right now the talk in Iraq is more on pushing out the Turkish troops. Uh, and, you know, all the Iraqi groups right now, including the ones you mentioned, and also that I haven't seen Iraqis united on any issue regarding security as they are against the presence of Turkish troops. Yesterday's parliamentary hearing, uh, if, for those who watched it, uh, you know, it's, it's really um, a first in the uh, post-2003 Iraqi history 
on, on this issue because, again, I think the Turkish presence and the Turkish Iraqi relations have come to an untenable uh, condition. Uh, that is more. I believe that, uh, yes, we have a, a resolution uh, by parliament, past parliament, to uh, expel U.S. troops, but I think the Iraqi-American strategic uh, dialogue has taken care of that, implemented most of that, and I believe that the new uh, uh, government will not deviate from the outcome of these negotiations. Um, and uh, you might sort of see that there are there are some voices within the new coalition uh, and uh, to to get the American forces out. I doubt you know that this is a priority. I think the priority right now is to uh, to, to think about what Turkey uh, is posing in northern Iraq. But isn't it, and maybe this is addressed to both you, Abbas and Mohsen, I mean, isn't it the case still that for Iran, a primary strategic goal is to get US forces out of the region, be it Iraq, be it Syria, be it Lebanon. I mean, that's that's something that is, you know, they have always been, you know, especially since the, uh, since the death of, uh, since the assassination of uh, Mr. Soleimani. That's, that's a, a question I'm putting out there. But on the point of how to, you know, in terms of tools, uh, and I think Abbas mentioned that, and he and I appear often on television shows together. And we, cause, we both argue that what we need is to develop a healthy norm relationship between the United States and Iraq. We need to move it from being security focused and to focus on the multiple facets on into a multifaceted relationship between an Iraqi people and a, an American people. And so you have to factor in culture, you have to factor in educational exchanges, you have to factor in economic exchanges, you know, uh, commercial uh, banking uh, technology transfer. So I think, and, and as, as, as Abbas said, the Iraqi, the outcome of the sessions held under the Trump administration of the Iraqi US strategic dialogue talk about all these facets. And I think that's where this relationship needs to move to become more a normal state-to-state, people-to-people relationship. Awesome. Unmute, please. Uh, yes, it has been uh, Iran's strategic goal to get the US out of the region. But at the same time, Tehran is, I think, and I hope, they are pragmatic enough to know that that's not going to happen. Unlike a lot of people who think that the U.S. has decided to pivot toward Asia, uh, and that means that Iran is leaving the, uh, leaving the Middle East, I never thought that way. I still do not. I think what the U.S. is trying to do is to restructure its a position in the Middle East to become leaner and more effective. They have no intention of leaving. And, and when it comes to Iraq, Perhaps from an Iranian point of view, from the Islamic Republic point of view, it's good for the American troops to leave. But I have to be honest, if I would have been an Iraqi, I would have opposed that. I think the presence of the U.S. there uh, could create a balance uh, that, the, that the Iraqis need, a balance that uh, keeps the, Kurd, the Turks and the Iranians away. So from a... Uh, Iraqi national point of view, uh, from an Iraqi perspective, I think uh, uh, it's good to have some sort of a a U.S. presence in there. But whether I think that way or not, I don't see any sign that the U.S. is about to do that at this time. That could change uh, a month from now, two months from now. But at this time, I have absolutely seen no evidence for the U.S. to try to get uh, to get out of uh, 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 Iraq, and I think the, uh, the the key point that we haven't had a chance to talk about uh, is what happens to the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, now, uh, I just read something to this after this morning, right before the program began, that uh, Mr. Barak, former Prime Minister of uh, Israel, is quoted in Time magazine for saying that uh, if Iran decides to become a nuclear power, it can. 
And it's now too late to think that the surgical strike against Iran is going to stop Iran. Now, this is an important point uh, because either we're going to have a nuclear deal or if Iran continues that way, Iran is going to be a uh, nuclear power, uh, not a nuclear power that has tested it, but a nuclear potential nu nuclear power that can quickly develop the bomb should the top leadership decides to make. In either case, whether Iran goes the nuclear path or decides to take uh, the path of negotiation and a nuclear deal, uh, the impact is going to be profound on the relationship between Iran and Iraq, between Iran and Saudi Arabia and everything else. So in a way, I think everybody is waiting to see what happens to that, to those negotiations. And based on that, try to uh, decide where to go. Also, I think, you know, at the end of the day, these troops will have to leave one day. I don't think that the United States intends to keep these troops forever. Also, the purpose for their presence. Uh, and right now, their activities in Iraq are very limited. You know, they are not doing much uh, in terms of security uh, operations. The uh, heat of about getting them out and the pressure on the government happened in a specific context. The, the resolution was passed on the heels of that operation near Baghdad airport. It was the Trump administration's rhetoric and Trump's own threats to the Iraqis. And uh, the, the, the troops during the, um, the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the Trump administration um, the, were, were engaged in many operations that were away from the agreement between Iraq and government on their presence. Uh, and then the, uh, the talk was even going to take them or uh, talking about taking them beyond even that. And uh, I, I believe under the uh, both under the uh, uh, late days of uh, uh, Trump administration, when dialogue began, and, and the Iraqi pushback took place. I think the Trump administration changed its its position and walked back much of what Trump has said in the past. And also, the Aranda, the, the, the talks uh, continued in the Biden administration, and they they had also rounds uh, in uh, of talks in 2020 and 2021. Uh, sorry, in 2021 uh, under under uh, Obama uh, under sorry uh, Biden. So uh, there is less than that. Also. Um, at the Iraqi military commander level, um, they, they, they do pressure uh, the Iraqi government not to uh, do this in a, in a not amicable way or in a hostile way to, leave, to get the Americans leave as it happened in 2011. Uh, it, uh, because they do benefit a lot from the uh, U.S. Uh, aid in terms of training, in terms of experiences, in terms of also all the support. The United States stands today as probably the largest foreign supporter of Iraq in terms of amounts of money. Uh, I believe that recently, the, as Mohsen just mentioned, there, are, there have been uh, talk about or, or there have been actual activation of other parts of the strategic framework agreement, uh, you know, the return of the largest uh, amount or number of Iraqi artifacts, more than 17,000 pieces were returned to Iraq, uh, the largest in Iraqi history. Uh, they were returned from the United States, including the Gilgamesh tablets. Um, there was, uh, there is a lot of uh, help on, on education, on the economic side. Uh, uh, there, are, there are so many ways that we see the United States is, I mean, also there are other countries, Western countries and US allies who uh, condition their presence and aid to the Iraqis on the presence of the United States. So I believe the task is not to get the American troops per se, but it is how to reach a mutual agreement that when the troops, whether they stay or they leave, they don't, this decision doesn't uh, become an unhealthy decision, either uh, keeping the troops against the will of the Iraqis or taking out, them out uh, uh, against the American wish. That needs to be a mutually agreed decision and well-defined terms for their staying or for their, their departure. But ultimately, I think uh, the, the Iraqis, like all other nations on earth, they would like to have their, their own 
security forces to take the care of their, they don't like to see foreign troops. That's why, you know, Turkey right now is rejected and many others, even Iran, uh, you see many Iraqis uh, don't like to see uh, any anybody, even Iraqis who are related to Iran, they are not accepted as, you know, the, the uh, Iraqi counterterrorism service, services accepted by all Iraqis. So it is a natural thing. And I believe that everybody, the United States, Iraq, the region, uh, Iran, they need to believe in the idea that it is good for Iraqis to build the capacity of their own forces and depend on themselves, at least for internal security, because we have not been speaking about external threats, only internal threats that Iraq has to deal with it. And I think the Iraqi forces today are more than capable of taking care of that with the uh, coordination with others. Thank you so much. We have a short time, so I'd love just quick responses out of you guys on, on a couple more questions that I have. Um, uh, Ahmed, I, I wanted to come back to you. Um, since Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi came into power last August, Iran's exports to Iraq have reached approximately $8 billion through June, and in return imported approximately $1 billion. Um, as you mentioned, this seems to be uh, quite lopsided. Uh, why is this the case, and are there efforts to amend this sizable gap from the Iraqi side? There's a very quick answer to that. I mean, yes, it's very much lopsided, uh, but the fact is it's lopsided not because Iran is dominant in any way. It's lopsided because um, our economy is 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 uh, structured the wrong way. We're state dependent. We pretty much don't make anything. And so therefore, what will Iran import from us? Uh, gas, electricity, uh, oil. Um, we haven't really got anything to uh, to export to Iran. I mean, the, our, the largest export we have is oil. And I don't think Iran needs any more oil from us. Um, so yes, it's lopsided. But again, I keep on emphasizing, by the way, those figures are not what they seem. The 8 uh, million, it's way ahead of, of what it should be. Um, and even the 1 uh, uh, billion on Iraq side is not really true, I believe, because our normal exports to Iran have been in the year about 100, 150 million. So I think when they talk about that billion, it's more likely to be the products that we can buy for them under the, the, the swap agreement on the uh, payments and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ultimately, uh, we need to put our house, house in order before we actually can fix our uh, trade with all, all our neighbors. All our trade with everybody else is actually lopsided, not only Iran. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I want to turn to uh, Abbas briefly, Abbas, since Turkey was mentioned on several occasions, and I, and I wonder about the trilateral relationship here. Of course, all three countries share sizable borders. As mentioned, President Erdogan was in Tehran last week with a meeting with Iranian leaders. Meanwhile, we have seen backlash across Iraq uh, and the uh, IKR after the alleged artillery strike in, in uh, the Kurdish region. So where are these respective relations headed between Baghdad and Ankara? How is Erbil responding? And Mohsen or Aranda, I'd love uh, your thoughts on the Tehran-Ankara relationship and where that may be heading. Well, uh, Iraqi-Turkish relations have been uh, up and down. There are a few issues among these countries uh, that are of dispute um, or, or between them. Uh, there is, uh, of course, the biggest issue that Iraq is suffering from is water. Turkey has built several dams on their side and that uh, chalked the Tigris almost now. You could walk across these two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, the largest amount of water that flows down those uh, uh, two rivers, uh, which really give the identity of Mesopotamia, uh, is, uh, is, is, an, uh, is problematic. Uh, Turkey charges Iraq of uh, not being uh, efficient in water management and, and all that. And Iraq says it is these uh, these uh, dams that are you know that are are, are uh, causing this drought. Um, and and uh, I believe that what what makes this problem is that the two countries have not reached an agreement to have a a, a treaty over water because both of them define these two rivers differently. Uh, you know, uh, Iraq insists that these are international rivers, which means there are, they, there are certain obligations towards Turkey. 
in terms of water portions. Turkey says, no, they are Turkish rivers that cross the border. So that's kind of, or they are border crossing rivers. And that kind of technicality uh, causes this. Uh, also, Iraq is uh, in a very hot area and a lot of water is lost to evaporation. Man water mismanagement is granted. Iraq is still needs to do a lot on updating their water management uh, methods. But this is a problem. The other problem, again, is this military uh, security uh, problem, which is really even more than water now It's uh, when it comes to their the dispute. Turkey has penetrated uh, into uh, deep areas in northern Iraq uh, using the confusion in the north. Um, you know, uh, Iraq and, and uh, uh, has problems. The Iraqi government, national government in Baghdad versus the Kurdistan regional government don't have trust of one another. So uh, many areas within the Iraqi Kurdistan region remain unprotected. Uh, um, the, the Peshmerga are not able to defend them and also the Iraqi uh, uh, security forces are not allowed in. So that allowed many pockets for for, for terrorists and, and other uh, 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 groups, fighting groups and armed groups, including the PKK, uh, a, a Turkish opposition, violent uh, militant opposition group uh, to operate uh, in the mountains of, of Iraq. And this has been even prior 2003 uh, problem, but it has been bad. So what Turkey used that uh, to uh, have many uh, uh, bases inside Iraqi uh, 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 territories. Uh, they are illegal bases. The Iraqi government never acknowledged them, never accepted them. There is no treaty or agreement between the two countries that allows any penetration of Turkish troops inside Iraqi land. They've been bombing constantly under the pretext of uh, fighting terrorism. Uh, but I think the last uh, uh, bombardment that, that, that caused the, uh, the, uh, the death of many Iraqi civilians uh, unified the Iraqis and brought this issue really to the forefront. The Iraqi government has many tools that was reluctant to, to do them, basically because they don't want to open another front. They already are fighting on several fronts and they didn't want to open a Turkish front. Uh, so, uh, but I think they have many tools, including going to the UN, uh, UN Security Council, including going to the international courts, find any way to, uh, to, to pressure the Turks, uh, especially that this area is not just a, an instantaneous problem. Uh, there is a dispute that dates back to, to, to 1918 uh, about those, those pieces of land and Turkey never gave up uh, those claims about them. So I think for the health of the relations, this needs to be put in, in a better uh, legal uh, condition and not allow this fluid situation to continue and facts are created on the ground. It's unacceptable by any means on any international law measures that a country illegally would have military bases that include even ability to fly uh, um, uh, aircrafts from 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 those, and the other government is unable to even talk about it. Given what Ahmed and Mohsen and, and, and Randa just mentioned about Iraqi Turkish trade relations, I think you know again, uh, close to twenty billion dollars are worth for the Turks to compromise and be reasonable in dealing with Iraq. But also the Iraqi government needs to find a way to put its house together and work with the Kurdistan regional government to end the pretext and the, 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 the causes that Turkey is, is, is using to get that and maybe find a way to eliminate the PKK problems and finally uh, reach a, a, an amicable solution to this problem that cannot go anywhere in the good direction unless it's taken care of now. Thank you. Randa, uh, did you want to respond? Yeah, quickly on the Iran-Turkish relations, especially in Syria, which I think might have also repercussions on their relations um, on Iraq. There are increasing tension between the two countries in Syria. And in fact, the last meeting in Tehran, the trilateral summit, uh, was uh, mostly an exercise in managing tensions between them, which Putin, you know, took, um, you know, took, uh, took to, uh, did. Um, both countries are trying to basically create some new fait accompli on the ground, being more opportunistic, which is running against uh, Russia's wishes of keeping 
that frozen that conflict frozen within its current uh, you know equations if we can put it among the different external stakeholders in the country and so um, I mean it's not clear whether they were able I mean he was able to convince Erdogan to forego an incursion in northern Syria but also I think his message in Tehran to uh, Raisi and to the Iranians is that you know do not be greedy you know be happy with what you achieved in Syria and stay within those terms. And uh, they, are about, they are going to have another meeting soon in Moscow, partly because I think Moscow assesses the situation between these two countries to be pretty, you know, uh, not, I mean, tense and, and, and explosive. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, we're really uh, coming to the end, but I just have one more question. I, I will open up, uh, give you guys a chance to follow up on anything you may want to add uh, uh, on the climate issues. Um, we've seen so many intense sandstorms uh, in, in these two countries, in particular this year, with so many thousands being hospital, hospitalized. Um, this seems to have prompted a delegation from Iran uh, last month, led by the head of Iran's Department of Environment. Rhonda, you note in the recent Middle East Dialogue report, uh, July report, which you chaired, that the climate shocks will impact this region at twice the rate of the rest of the world, and that this is an opportunity for these countries to overhaul and revamp economies to face the multitude of challenges, some that Abbas mentioned, increased flooding, desertification, drought, soil erosion, water shortage, increased energy consumption with higher temperatures. Rhonda, just briefly, is there collective action that has, that has been or can be carry out, carried out to alleviate these issues? What is being done to drive forward the energy transition in the Middle East? And where are the opportunities for these two countries? I think the sandstorms have been real a wake up call for the countries and especially the health implication. We have already seen an MOU signed between the Emirati Minister of Climate Change and her Iranian counterpart on the sidelines of a conference on climate. I think it has a big title, but it was a conference on title and the environment that took place mid-July in Tehran. Uh, we saw also a visit by the Iranian minister or director of climate uh, to Kuwait, where they have also signed a similar MOU. The MOU calls for exchanging information, expertise, uh, mutual visits by experts between the countries. And recently, also when asked about whether Saudi Arabia is part of this uh, regional project or this regional endeavor to discuss uh, dust storms in the region, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, director of the environment office said that they have been talking with the Saudis through a third party, I'm assuming it's the, the Emiratis. And uh, one of the, one, 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 um, I would say item in the MOU signed between, by the Emirati and the Iranian is to establish a regional, uh, a regional uh, process uh, for early warning and for uh, prevention of these dust storms. So I think I'm, I'm seeing, you know, I expected this to happen on COVID two years ago. It did not happen, that kind of regional collaboration. Well, we are seeing the beginning of it on the dust storms. So it's a good sign. Thank you, Rhonda. Let me uh, just give uh, Mohsen Ahmed Abbas just 60 seconds uh, for your closing remarks. Anything you may want to touch on or add in particular uh, on what a healthy relationship may, uh, looks like moving forward between Iran and Iraq. Mohsen, with you. First. Uh, yes, uh, my knowledge about climate change is uh, minus five, so I have nothing to add uh, to what Rando has said. But let me just say a few words about your question about Tehran and Ankara, Tehran and Turkey. I believe in something called historical memory. Uh, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, and the Persian Empire were engaged in over 200 years of war, uh, useless war. They signed a number of treaties. And as a result of this, both countries have learned how to manage the conflict in a non a kinetic, non-violent way. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, Turkey is a member of uh, NATO. And if there, uh, there is no other member of NATO neighboring Iran, and they have disagreements over Northern Iraq, they have fundamental disagreements over Syria, and yet they have been talking and they have been negotiating. And I believe they will continue talking and negotiating. They have been two good neighbors. As to Iraq, Iran's relationship, I think 
I hope that the good relationship between Iran and Iran that is started after 2003 continues. And I wish both countries best of luck. Ahmed. Yes, uh, yeah, I'll be uh, 60 seconds or less as well. Uh, I think yes to on, on climate, definitely climate uh, climate uh, change and the crisis that comes with it knows no borders. And I think we all need to realize that um, and work together when it comes to water, when it comes to issues. Energy transition, by the way, um, I think we, uh, Iraq and Iran, are light years uh, behind. Uh, our neighbors like Saudi Arabia and the, and the Emirates, we need to learn and work with them on how they're uh, transitioning. But I think going back on, on Iraq and the relationship with Iran and pretty much I think almost every other country in the region, I think all our relationships, all Iraq's relationships with all its neighbors, pretty much is mostly a lopsided, it's one way. Um, I think, in a sense, like right now, we are, uh, you know, we're, we're all sort of as Iraqis are being quite happy that Iraq is acting as a mediator, blah, 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 and so forth. However, I think um, for us to build healthy relationships with our neighbors, we need to, uh, to put our house in order, both economically and politically, because currently the way it stands right now, I mean, uh, no matter what we say about good relationships or bad relationships, our neighbors, especially, especially Iran and Turkey, act with impunity in Iraq. Uh, Iran, you know, a, a, in, in February, it attacks Iraq in Erbil. Um, nothing happens. To, Turkey sort of does the, the attack uh, now, and plus multiple other attacks that have had in the past few years. Nothing really happens. I think our neighbors act with impunity uh, in Iraq, uh, either over what we should have or should do as a country, i.e., you know, what is good or bad for Iraqis. I think that's Iraqis decide that. Nobody else can decide that. But we're not going to be able to have a healthy relationship with our neighbors. And we must, for historical reasons and for the benefits of all uh, our people, we need to put our house in order so we can have healthy relationships with our neighbors. And I think we must have those. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I believe that Iraq and Iran given all of that historical relations, given all of this long border, more than 1400 kilometers border between them, uh, they have to have good relations. Uh, it's, it's not healthy for the two countries to go back to the years of conflict. I say that from personal experience, my uh, early life was defined by that Iraq-Iran war. It started when I was 15 and it ended when I graduated in college, from college. Um, our entire generation was shaped by it. Uh, people who were born in the same year I was, many of them, unless they were in college, most of them died in that war. So it's really a, a, a tragedy that will continue with us. So uh, Mohsen just mentioned earlier that that memory really is important for the Iranians, but I argue also it's for the Iraqis. Iraqis also don't want to have to fight with a country as big as Iran much more uh, or in population size and much more in geography size. But also, I believe that Iraq uh, has uh, adopted the right policy in, in the last few administrations uh, from at least 2016, uh, the, the positive neutrality and the focus on improving relations with all Iraq's neighbors. It has brought Iraq in a better standing, and that's why we see now Iraq is being trusted mediator instead of being in the past the uh, battleground among these countries to settle their scores, and that is very good. Um, and, and we need to have that continued. Again, uh, we really want to re-emphasize that relations among these countries should focus on bilateral benefits and bilateral interests for the sake of the good of their own peoples and their states, rather than having those relations as a stepping stone for settling scores that Iraq has nothing to do with. Um, in other words, whether it's the Gulf countries or Arab countries or Turkey for that matter, they should not use their rela relations with Iraq as an approach towards scoring points against Iran, and Iran should do the same as well, shouldn't use Iraq uh, against its uh, rivals in the region. Iran also has played, overplayed its hand uh, because of the confidence and the head start it had. And I think they did ha uh, have many setbacks uh, that amounted to 
the point of having their consulates in cities like Karbala and Najaf burnt by angry Iraqi people and putting all their bets on the politicians in Iraq and losing the Iraqi people, I think is not a wise strategy for Iran. It is just a bad tactic. And I think Iran needs to uh, also uh, touch the ground and sort of don't fly too high in their hopes that they have Iraq in their pockets. Iraq is a very tough country uh, historically and now, and I think it will take more work uh, to continue having good relations and enjoying good relations with Iraq. And that's a lesson maybe for all the neighbors. Thank you so much. Uh, gosh, I got to say, I, I was kind of uh, anxious to moderate such an esteemed panel. Uh, but I feel like I would love another 90 minutes with you all. Um, alas, our time uh, has come to an end for today. So let me just thank our audience for joining us today. Thank each of you, our panel speakers, for your time and your en enlightening analysis, and to our AC team that made this all happen. Have a good rest of your Monday. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.